She always, she always marks me with her lipstick. You bet. <laughs> uh, my mother once told me I was going to hell if I didn't change my ways. And judging from the heat around here, I think I'm pretty close. <laughs> my name is Edgar Rochelle Fouché. I'm here to speak about secret government technology, reverse engineering of alien artifacts, and the top secret MJ-12 committee which I write with about with my author, Brad Steiger. Brad, uh, as you know, has published 143 books and has 15 million copies in print, which is pretty incredible. Before I'm through, you'll know exactly what the Flying Triangle is, the one that's been sighted around the world. It's the most exotic and classified aerospace vehicle that's ever been built. It may be stealthily hovering over Phoenix, Belgium, or your city. I'll show you pictures of Air Force, Air, Air, <coughs> excuse me, Air Force aircraft I've worked, declassified Air Force aircraft, and classified aircraft that's never been seen before. I'll also explain how we come upon that technology. First, I'll share some of my family background. I was born to fifth generation French Americans, and many of my relatives for generations have involved, been involved <coughs> with the government and fields of intelligence crypto and classified development projects. This is true as far back as Joseph Fouché and the French Revolution, where he was the prime minister under Napoleon. He was the head of the French secret national police force and a direct ancestor of mine. Joseph Fouché started the first organized intelligence organization in the world. The CIA, the Russian KGB, the English MI5, the Israeli Mossad and many other intelligence agencies have used and expanded upon his methods of intelligence gathering, networking information, and political survival. Some French historians consider him a scoundrel because he survived Napoleon and the King of France. <clears throat> My career background spans 30 years, and since the government isn't about to support my claims, you'll see from the positions I've held the programs I've worked, that I was in a position to gather the information I'm presenting. My first job was as a machinist making bombs for the U.S. Air Force at R.G. Letourneau. <clears throat> I would be involved with the Department of Defense in one way or the other for the next 25 years. After being drafted into the Vietnam conflict, I initially went through a year of intelligence, communications, and cryptological schools. During the years 1967 through 1974, I was stationed or worked at many of the Tactical Air Command, Air Training Command, Pacific Air Forces Command bases. <clears throat> During the Vietnam conflict, I was assigned to special projects at Kadena Air Force Base, Okinawa, Udorn Air Force Base, Thailand, Benoit Air Force Base, Vietnam, and spent anywhere from a day to a month at many other Southeast Asian bases. With my training and experiences in intelligence equipment, special electronics, black programs, and cryptological areas, I received other government opportunities. I filled major command liaison positions, headquarters manager, DOD factory representatives for TAC, SAC, ATC, and PACAF. Later in my career as a defense contractor and engineering manager, I dealt with classified black programs developing state-of-the-art electronics, logistics, and technical data, <coughs> and automatic test equipment. I was considered an Air Force expert with classified electronics countermeasures, test equipment, cryptological test equipment, and automatic test equipment. I worked with many of the leading aircraft manufacturers and Department of Defense contractors. I participated as a key member in Flight operational test and evaluation, design, development, production, program, state-of-the-art avionics, including electronic countermeasures, satellite communications, cryptological equipment, and sport equipment. During my career, I was handpicked development cadre for many of the Air Force's newest fighter and bomber development programs. I was cadre for the F-111 swing wing bomber, the F-15 Eagle air superiority fighter, the A-10 Warthog Close Air Support Fighter. Next slide. 
the F-16 Falcon fighter. Next slide. And the P-1 Lancer bomber. Next slide. Other research and development programs I've worked as far back as the 70s are still classified top secret. I received over 4,000 hours of technical training from the military and the government, about which of half was classified. This is a picture of the Boeing F-22 Raptor, air dominance fighter. My involvement with black programs developing stealth, air, stealth aircraft is still classified. I am perhaps the only person who has actually worked at top secret Groom Lake Air Base within Area 51 of the Nellis Range and written about it and can prove it. I spent 20 years working directly for the U.S. Air Force and DOD agencies. That's a F-117 at Groom. Followed by another eight years as a defense contractor manager, my last position for the Air Force was strate Strategic Air Command Liaison. As a defense contractor manager, I performed as engineering program manager and site manager for DOD contractors involved in classified development, logistics support, and electronics engineering. I am now CEO of Fouché Media Associates, which I run with my beautiful wife, Rebecca. I'm also the inventor of NeuroSync MIME, a behavior modification software using hypnotic entrainment and subliminal messages. I wrote Alien Rapture the Chosen in 1994 and 95 after my last trip to California, New Mexico, and Nevada. I undertook this trip to do research for Alien Rapture, which included a meeting with five close friends who agreed to release confidential information to me and discuss their closely guarded personal experiences. I also interviewed other contacts who had worked classified programs, such as SR-71 pilots and engineers on black programs, and others who had flown classified development aircraft to gather information on UFO sightings and contact. At this point, I was blessed with teaming up with a great man and a great writer, Brad Steiger who's a great friend also. I had decided to get out of the defense industry as I felt the fraud, waste, and abuse was rampant both on the government and contractor sides. I wanted to work for myself as a writer and develop my own ideas and products. So far, I've been a terrible boss. I've worked myself incredibly long hours with no benefits and a meager salary. Who were the five friends and co-conspirators, I like to call them, and a host of others, you might ask. The first friend was Gerald, a former NSA national security investigator and TREAT team member. TREAT stands for Tactical Reconnaissance Engineering Assessment Team. I think some of you call them men in black. He worked for the Department of Energy and the National Secur Security Agency. This was his cover. But ultimately, the National Security Agency controlled all his movements and everything he did. His job required him to watch employees with top secret and Q clearances and other classified clearances at the Nevada test site, the Nellis Range, Los Alamos, Sandia, and many other bases. <coughs> He spent a lot of time out at Area 51 for years before I even knew what he was involved in. This is where the, uh, previously the most classified aerospace testing in the world took place. You may know it as Groom Lake, Watertown, the ranch, or Dreamland. He was found dead of a heart attack a year after our last meeting. The second friend, Sal, was a person who worked directly for the National Security Agency with Electronics Intelligence, or ELINT, and became a de defense contractor upon his retirement. The third friend, Doc, was an SR-71 spy plane pilot and a U.S. Air Force test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base. The fourth friend, Dale, and I were in the service together during the Vietnam conflict, and I've known him since the early 70s. His father worked for the NSA for over 25 years, and he's the one that sent me the MJ-12 documents. I'll discuss the MJ-12 documents last. The fifth friend, Bud, was a DOD contractor, electronics engineer, worked te top secret development programs, dealing with electronics countermeasures, radar homing and warning, ECM jammers, and infrared receivers. He retired as a program manager 
and later died of a brain tumor within 30 days after his symptoms appeared. I also received input from uh, four other SR-71 pilots, two U-2 pilots, a TR-1 pilot, and about two dozen fighter and bomber jocks. I got the picture of the TR-3B from a person in this latter group. At the time, I had no intention of writing about programs I was involved in due to the Secrecy Act and classification documents I had signed. I had my fill of working for the government and uh, defense contractors. However, it bothered each of us that we'd had experience with unusual phenomena, extremely advanced technology, and witnessed unidentified aerial contact that had not been previously reported. As we sat at a table in a dark corner of the Silver Dollar Saloon in Las Vegas, discussing our experiences and swapping knowledge, each of the group of five assured me that they trusted me enough to write about their secrets and protect them. We agreed to get together the next year with an understanding that I would contact each of them and set up the meeting. In the meantime, I wrote down all of our notes and their input and their contacts from other friends about unusual phenomena and per their personal sightings. Many of the things the group revealed to me were startling, even to me, who had worked 25 years on black programs. I used the information to piece together the story now titled Alien Rapture of the Chosen. I'm going to share some of these secrets and unusual phenomena with you this, evening, this afternoon. The SR-71 was designed as a spy plane for the CIA in the 60s and designated the A-12. The Mach 3 Plus aircraft first flew in 1962, taken off from Groom Lake Air Base in Area 51. Later, once the Air Force took over the operation, it was designated the SR-71 Blackbird. My friend Chuck, an SR-71 pilot, related to me an in-flight incident he had in the 1970s. He was returning from a reconnaissance flight, was at an altitude of 74,000 feet and a speed of Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. He noticed something flickering in his, in his peripheral vision. Hovering over his left wingtip was a ball of dense plasma-like light. When he stared at it for more than a few seconds, it hurt his eyes. Chuck tried to use his UHF, VHF, and HF communication sets to no avail. There was nothing but static. Repeatedly glancing <clears throat> at the ball of light, he watched in amazement as it moved effortlessly about his aircraft. At one point, the light positioned itself a few front feet in front of the spike cone of the air intake inlet. The enormous amount of air rushing <clears throat> excuse me, into the engines should have sucked in and shredded almost anything in its path, but the light orb was mysteriously unaffected. The light, he noted, acted in a curious manner. If something inanimate could act in a curious manner, or act in any manner at all, it moved from time to time to other parts of the aircraft, staying <clears throat> until its approach to Beale Air Force Base, California. It was inside of the air base when the plasma ball finally pulled away from the aircraft in a wide arc at ever-increasing speeds. Of course, after reading his incident report, his operations commander told him never to speak of this incident. When Chuck related the story to me, he was absolutely convinced this plasma ball was controlled by some form of intelligence. I have over two dozen stories from pilots of similar incidents with UFOs and plasma balls. Have you ever heard stories about missing memory? <clears throat> Sal worked a program for two years in a top secret research facility in California. At the end of the program, he started having flu-like symptoms. And after several days of worsening symptoms, went to his company doctor. His company prescribed some medication and sent him home for two days. On the third day, he woke up and couldn't remember where he worked or who he worked for. He called his brother. His brother, in a panic, called up the company. The company informed him that his job had been terminated because his contract had run out. Sal was the SR-71 pilot I spoke of earlier. To this day, 
and uh, I can't say to this day, I haven't heard from Sal in two years. <laughs> the only thing he could ever reconstruct was from his pay records, letter of offer, and his personal notes, engineering notes, to convince him he actually had worked there. The company in question was involved in developing the TR3B gravity disruption device called the magnetic field disruptor, which is the circular accelerator part of the TR3B, which I'll go into more detail in a minute. Have any of you ever heard of the super, uh, excuse me, super strong foil-like material at Roswell? I'm sure most of you have heard something about it. Another friend who worked for General Dynamics in Fort Worth described a program in which he worked a plasma accelerator in the mid-60s researching gravity warping techniques. He is a physicist by education and trade. This was his first top secret program. <coughs> he described a foil-like material <coughs> much like that reported discovered after Roswell crash. He described the foil as 12 layers of material less than 10 thousandths of an inch thick. It was as flexible as a plastic trash bag but virtually indestructible to piercing, burning, or cutting, which you've probably all heard before. Here's what you haven't heard. In order to cut the material used for the project, the material was supercooled, a large electrical charge was applied to polarize the molecular structure, and a laser cl cutter was applied in order to cut this material. Large ribbons of this material were used to reinforce the accelerator, which contained the mercury-based plasma that they started researching in 1965. The plasma was cooled to superconductive temperatures, rotated at 45,000 revolutions per minute, and pressurized at 150,000 atmospheres. This would be considered state-of-the-art technology even today, some 30 years after he worked the project. 33, okay. <laughs> yeah. He related that the project achieved this objective Instruments and test objects placed within the center of the accelerator showed a 50% loss in weight attributed to the reduction in the gravitational field. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about this technology when I address the TR3B and the magnetic field disruptor. From 1973 through 1976, I was home base at Edwards Air Force Base. It is near Lancaster, California, and even near the San Andreas Fault. Edwards has a long history of secret technology and experimental aircraft. It's a shame that's not clear. That's a B-2 stealth aircraft. It's a beautiful picture. The YB-49 was flown in 1948 at Edwards Air Force Base, which looks a lot like the B-2 stealth bomber. The XB-70 was first flown in 1964 and looks a lot like the new top secret SR-75 the Air Force says doesn't exist. Edwards is the home of the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School and is responsible for flight operational test and evaluation of the Air Force's newest aircraft. It hosts a number of tenant organizations, including NASA and a Jet Propulsion Laboratory facility. I worked the F-111 Swing Wing Bomber, the F-15 Air Superiority Fighter, the F-16 Fighter, the A-10 Close Air Support Attack Aircraft, and the B-1 Stealth Bomber. I was involved with these and other classified development product programs when they were just a gleam in some pilot trainee's eyes. One night, a longtime friend of mine and I were standing on top of the Fairchild A-10 hangar at Edwards Air Force Base. It was 2 a.m. in a perfectly clear night with millions of stars visible to the naked eye. This was a very common night at Edwards. I noticed a group of stars we were looking at was seemed to be shifting in color. And at the time, I, I could name quite a few constellations. I'd just taken an astrology course. And uh, I definitely knew what the Big Dipper was. I made, a C in a, I made a C in that course, I think, or a B. So I pointed out to my friend that the three stars near the Big Dipper in triangular formation were not supposed to be there. We watched as the strobing stars shifted in color to a, from a reddish yellow I'm excuse, from a bright blue to a reddish yellow. After a period of about 20 minutes, we could tell that the objects weren't stars because they were getting larger. This was somewhat unnerving. It was further unnerving when the space in between the stars started blocking out the stars in the background. 
We decided it probably was a top secret Air Force vehicle of some type. Still, we weren't sure. Uh, at the time, I didn't believe in UFOs. And that's the honest truth. The vehicle had gone from half the size of the Big Dipper to twice its size in a half hour. It had moved from the west to the east towards Edwards Air Force Base. About that time, we could make out the silhouette or outline of the triangle. The lights are possibly exhaust, flared brighter, and vanished in an instant from the sky. This experience wasn't my first sighting, but it was one of the few where I had a witness. In the summer of 1976, I relocated to Nellis Air Force Base north of Las Vegas. I spent three and a half years there. I worked primarily with the F-15 electronics countermeasures and automatic test equipment. <clears throat> I'd heard rumors of air bases located in the desert at places called Mercury, Indian Springs, and others that didn't even have names at the time. Before the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the USSR, no one talked about their classified work experiences, nor did we repeat rumors of top secret technology or aircraft. Most of us who, have top <clears throat> who had top secret clearances never even told our wives what programs we were working what we're, or where we were going. I once sp spent six months in Vietnam while my wife thought I was at a classified school in Denver, Colorado. The military in a court of law has actually denied the existence of classified Air Force Base inside the Nellis Range, out in the Nevada desert, within Area 51. Don't you know the plaintiffs and the lawyer were surprised to hear this? <laughs> but that's another story. I was one of the few personnel at Nellis who had top secret clearance with crypto access and was certified on specific NSA cryptological equipment. I was certified on the Mode 4 IFF system for aircraft also, which uses encrypted codes. It was due to a combination of coincidence and my technical experience and my certification from, that I was requested to be temporarily assigned to a place which had no name. I was told by my commander to report to an office on the base. He didn't know where I was going to be working or how long I was going to be gone. And he was pretty ticked off at me because at the time we were fielding the F-15 electronics countermeasures equipment and it was critical. And uh, I think to this day he remembers that. <coughs> I left one month, the first mo Monday morning at 4.30 a.m before sunrise. We boarded a blue Air Force bus with the windows blackened out. There were 28 other people on the bus in the first trip, including two security policemen with M16s and a bus driver. There was only one thing said to us for the whole trip. When we got on the bus, they told us, do not speak. And when the bus closed the doors, he repeated, do not speak unless you're spoken to. Well, if you ever had an M16 pointed in your direction, you don't talk. So we just, and it's, uh, it was pretty bad because the windows were, uh, you couldn't see anything. And eventually this fine silted dust started coming in the windows and you knew you were out in the desert. In the 1950s, the government started building the super secret Groom Lake facilities for the CIA's U-2 spy plane. It's located in the north central part of the Nellis Range in designated Area 51. Construction of facilities continues even to today, except mostly at Papoose and south of there. The SR-71, the TR-1, the F-117, and then a, can you back up one slide? Don't you know when it was really dark, a lot of people thought that was a UFO? Okay, next slide. And the B-2. That's not a B-2, that's an SR-75. We're tested at Grimm. Now the top secret SR, back up just one for a second. Now the top secret SR-75, the SR-74, now next slide, and the TR-3B are operated there. Many of these aircraft have been misidentified as UFOs. When we reached Grimm, the bus had pulled into an aircraft and they shut the doors. The security policemen dispatched the regular workers to their jobs. I was escorted to the electronics building with a, sar <clears throat> with a sergeant who had an M16. I'm going to tell you something you've never heard before, and every person that comes after me that tells you they've worked at Groom, I want you to ask them about this. 
Because no matter how much technology you work, how many times you talk to people, you forget things. But you never forget discomfort. I was given a pair of hairy glasses to wear, which can only be described as looking like welder's goggles. There is no peripheral vision. They have polarized lenses. And anything past 30 feet is blurred. It's like looking through your shower glazed glass. If an M1 tank barrel had been pointing at me at 50 feet away, I wouldn't have had a clue. But I, that's exactly how they work. <clears throat> the whole time I was there, some 10 consecutive, day, consecutive days, first time, followed by numerous follow-up visits, the routine was the same. Leave Nellis Air Force Base before sunrise and return after dark. Only once did I get a glance at the whole base. They were getting ready to fly a uh, class gun and they flew me up in a helicopter, and I was supposed to wear the goggles the whole way, but I kind of peeked. I kind of shifted around you know, like you do one of these things. So I actually got a look at it from the air. For those stationed at Grimm or commuting there daily, the flight schedules are posted for classified flights. Everyone not cleared for that particular pro program or flight has to be indoors, and there are no windows where you can see out on the flight line or into other hangars. You have to be off the flight line and inside 30 minutes prior to any classified flight. <laughs> As you know, a couple of thousand personnel are, are flown in to groom and Papoose and other facilities that, that they've now moved further south every day from McCarran Air Force Base, I mean, excuse me, McCarran Airport in Las Vegas and Edwards Air Force Base. Many people drive in from Tonopah that to live north of the range. Other people commute through Mercury and Indian Springs from Las Vegas. While at Groom, I made contacts. Later met them again at Nellis Air Force Base or around Las Vegas over time and became friends with them and stayed friends for many, many years. On my third day of the job at Groom, I had to remove a module from a multi-bay piece of satellite communications equipment used to support special mission aircraft. I noticed while inside this bay checking out the wiring, I contained a seal unit about the size of a large briefcase. <clears throat> I noticed it had a National Security Agency ID plate on it. The nomenclature on the nameplate was Direct Orbital Communications Link, which I thought was strange as the unit was part of a digital communications link used solely to communicate with classified Air Force vehicles. I was unaware at the time of any military orbital missions not directly related to NASA. Remember, that I'm talking about the late 70s. The space shuttle didn't fly until 1981. I disconnected the unit out of curiosity and removed the rear, <coughs> rear access cover. To my amazement, there were some half dozen large-scale integrated circuit chips with over 500 pins. This is, the inspection stamp was 1975. So you have to visualize what we have today going back to 1975 when, uh, did we even have TRS-80s then? Yeah. <clears throat> it was about the size of a Zippo lighter. The most, I believe the most advanced processor speeds uh, on, it, the NSA had at the time were equivalent to a IBM 8088 running about 4 million cycles per second. There was a, for any of the, you all familiar with technology, this processor ran at 1 billion cycles per second, which is about 4 million being 250 times greater. Yeah, I think that's about right. I haven't figured this out. But the reason I knew it, the clock speed was 1 billion cycles per second. There was a clock synchronization jack on the back of this unit, a BNC connector, which was labeled. And I had a frequency counter, and I actually measured it. And I just, I couldn't even, even working on black programs at the time, I couldn't imagine something that ran at 4 billion cycles per second when they didn't even have an Apple II Plus with 48K memory out there. And you know, we had these clunker IBMs that were like four bays that only ran at 4 million cycles per second. Yet, we had this one circuit card with modules on it. it just, it's incredible if you know even the slightest bit about technology. <clears throat> In the groom mess hall, I heard words like Lorentz forces, pulse detonation, cyclotron radiation, quantum flux transduction field generators, quasi-crystal energy lenses, 
and EPR quantum receivers. I'm not going to talk about quasi-crystals. I'll make a prediction. Quasi-crystals is the key to everything you want to ever know about how they got here. And that's all I'm going to say about it now. Except one of the quasi-crystals is the hydrogen crystal. I wrote down everything I saw, heard, and touched in my log every night. But uh, as you would expect, <clears throat> the food was great, but it had to be. There was no cable, no alcohol, and no women. So everybody got fat. <laughs> Later back at the base, my routine went the same. And I also had a part-time job at the Silver Dollar Saloon and Casino that Bill Ladd uh, owned up until a few years ago and may still uh, ran their security for him. Uh, I had this NSA friend, Gerald, that I mentioned previously, you may have forgot, but he's the one that watched the people with highly classified jobs at the Nellis Range, the Nevada Test Site, and other re areas around the Southwest. He was in a supervisor position and was way up in the NSA. But he liked the field jobs. He didn't like standing up around Fort Meade or any of the other places as uh, guys in three-piece suits hang out. <clears throat> but he, his his primary job was watching the people at Groom and uh, the Nevada test site where at the time they were still doing underground uh, atomic tests, exploding bombs. He happened to mention a vehicle that was boosted into orbit and returned to land in the Nevada desert. It was an unmanned reconnaissance ve vehicle that took off from a B-52 bomber and used booster rockets to place it in temporary Earth orbit, low Earth orbit for the purpose of taking reconnaissance pictures. I really thought he was feeding me a lot of bull at the time. And he said, this vehicle is remotely piloted and communications are made <clears throat> via the docile system at Groom. Uh, I'm not usually too slow, but it didn't hit me until I repeated, you know, direct orbital communications link, DOCL. Bingo, the light bulb went on. I had seen a piece of the docile equipment at Groom, the one with the large chips in it. These are old pictures of the virtual reality lab at Brooks Air Force Base where they developed the software to fly these classified, and by the way, they call them IPVs, independently piloted vehicles, not UA UAVs or RPVs on the black programs. After I agreed to, uh, it's certainly been one of these shows, okay. There. After I re agreed with my friends to write the story, there was a lot of discussion on who would stick their neck out. I don't know what that tells you about me. But they, uh, they were, long after we were researching this book, they stayed with the defense industry, and I got out. So I was the only one directly tied to them, so it fell on my shoulders. I talked to several military judge advocate general lawyers, or JAGs. Uh, well, I actually did. I actually made appointments with them. And uh, I told them I worked many classified programs, and I wanted to write some fiction story that are technology-based. I was told I couldn't name any real individuals with real clearances or covers or their working names. And I haven't. I was also told I couldn't discuss any details or technology of secret programs I had been personally assigned to, which I haven't done. Then I was told as long as I did that, I could damn well write what I wanted to, and I have. Of course, I didn't tell them I was going to write about the government conspiracy to cover up UFO contact and reverse engineering of government, <coughs> reverse engineering of alien technology, or that I was interviewing SR-71, U-2, TR-1, and the SR-75 pilots that I made contacts with over the years and had flown air, uh, classified aircraft. But I didn't think that was important at the time to tell them. <laughs> you don't think that was important? I mean, but you know, you give the government too much information, they just screw it up. In the summer of 1992, the five of us, excuse me, the five friends and I, there were six, See, when I run out of five fingers, I just get confused. I had completed my notes from our first meeting and interviews. 
On my last trip to Nevada in 1994, without benefit of my friends, I wanted to use uh, some information from some other retired military friends and cross-check my fa facts. Everything I've written about an alien rapture, I've got from at least two sources. I have a lot of stuff that I haven't written about, and I probably won't, that I couldn't verify. And every one of these sources, I either knew directly for 20 or 30 years who had worked black programs, or only talked to their closest friends that they had also known for many years. We did not talk to one person that somebody hadn't known for at least 15 years. We didn't want any strangers appearing with information. We only trusted our closest friends. <clears throat> Bud, one of my uh, co-conspirators, had informed me he had a cancerous tumor and was going through some serious depression. Uh, he died 30 days. It was just, it was just incredible. He uh, found out on a Thursday that uh, he was having numbness and dizziness. Went to the doctor, found out three days later he had a cancerous tumor. And uh, 29 and a half days, actually, later, I talked to him the night before he died. He was, he, he was gone. So... This was a, was a blow to all of us. He was, uh, he was our guru. Uh, the remaining three friends, Sal, has dropped from the face of the earth. Uh, it's hard to define paranoia on a group of, uh, of six people. Like we were at the time doing what we were trying to do. But Sal was the most paranoid. And he's called us up just a little over two years ago and said, um, I don't know if you're going to hear from me again. Because we actually uh, had a publisher and were convinced we may have a chance of getting this out before the government s set on it. So he just freaked out. He's, uh, I tr like to imagine that he's like on some island in the Pacific drinking Mai Tais or something, I hope. <clears throat> Let me talk about my friend Doc. He has a theory that UFOs seem to like fast aircraft. This uh, SR-71 pilot dock was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base, Okinawa, where the SR-71s were stationed on the sack side of the base back in 1973. In fact, I think they still are. I was there last time in 81. While flying back across the South China Sea from a reconnaissance mission, he encountered a shadow over his cockpit. Doc said his avionic systems went totally haywire and he felt the aircraft nose down slightly which can be dangerous at 2,000 miles an hour or 35 miles per minute. When he looked up, he was so startled that he almost panicked immediately, made evasive maneuvers to his right and down, which is one of the maneuvers they make if there's a missile detected. Doc said the object was so big that it totally blacked out the sun. His estimate was it was 250 feet, feet <clears throat> to 300 feet across. It was oval in shape, but he wasn't sure of the exact shape because there was a shimmering halo of energy uh, surrounding the vehicle. About three, about three minutes later and some thousands of feet lower, uh, the vehicle reappeared on his left wing tip. He tried his UHF and all he could pick up was a deep electrical hum. He abandoned his tips, made evasive maneuvers, and for the next ten minutes this thing moved about his aircraft effortlessly and stayed right on top of him. Doc said he, and I, I'm going to quote him exactly, Doc said he got this sound in his head, and his words were, like a swarm of bees in my brain, which is uh, it's an interesting, uh, must be an interesting sound. <laughs> the aircraft would move from the left to the right wingtip of his aircraft, and it would take about two minutes to move back and forth. When Doc returned from his mission, it was, it was the same routine as the earlier incident uh, I told you about. Uh, his commander uh, drug him down to his office the minute he opened his mouth about the incidents and gave him a direct order not to talk about it or they'd throw the book at him, and the book is the UCMJ. <clears throat> One of the interesting things that Doc related to me being an SR-71 pilot and a, a U.S. Air Force test, po test pilot, which is the elite in the Air Force are the test pilots, he said he didn't know one test pilot or SR-71 pilot or astronaut, and he can name most of them and give you their birthdays and their wives' names and tell you where they lived. He said he didn't know one that hadn't had some type of contact. But he also said he didn't know one that would ever come forward and be honest about their experiences for fear of retaliation from the government. You have to realize these people's pensions, which includes their livelihood, 
their medical coverage, their commissary and BX privileges. You know, the government controls all that, as do they mine, by the way. Doc had a friend, Dave, who was kind of a righteous kind of guy. He uh, didn't drink or smoke, and I, I, I've met the guy. He uh, kind of rubs you a little, but it's, it's people that are too perfect make those imperfect people a little uncomfortable, I guess. But Dave was drinking sake and, uh, over, <laughs> over in Okinawa with uh, Doc, which is kind of surprising since Doc had never seen him drink before. And he explained to him that he didn't start drinking until his last reconnaissance flight over eastern Russia. When he returned, Dave was so delirious that his crew, and I don't mean flight crew, I mean support crew on the ground, had to pull him out of the aircraft. Dave didn't know when he had taken off, what had happened, or how he got back. He woke up two days later at the Naval Regional Hospital in Okinawa. To this day, he remembers nothing of the flight. But he's also, every night since this flight, had nightmares. And his, his words were, something got to me up there in the air. <coughs> he still drinks. <laughs> well, that's good or bad. But, but he didn't talk about it. He didn't, he didn't tell the flight surgeon. Uh, in the uh, military, if you go to the flight surgeon and they see anything at all that seems unusual or unstable, they ground you. And pilots will give up their families, body parts, <laughs> and all their money to keep flying. If, if you've ever met them, especially test pilots and, and people that work black programs, that's what they live for. So he didn't talk to the flight surgeon. He self-medicated. And that's why there's so much alcoholism amongst cops and military is because they don't want to help people. They just want them to follow the rules. Anyway, Dave, uh, I actually looked up Dave. Gerald talked, convinced him. Uh, what you have to understand is these people I talked to wouldn't talk to me over the phone. And, of course, not a lot of people were emailing back when we started this in the early 90s. I actually had to talk around subjects over the phone and say, well, I'm going to be in your area and Gerald vouches for me, or Doc vouches for me, or you know Sal, and, and then say, yes, I had a long conversation with Gerald, or Sal, or Doc, and I'll talk to you if you're out here. And usually it was in a bar or on a long walk where there was nobody within 20 feet. And in, uh, that's why these people won't talk to reporters, because they know eventually somebody's going to find out who they are. But I spent 25 years in establishing my credibility. I've had two-star generals give me a direct order when I was just a sergeant, that if I didn't tell them what, for example, Westinghouse engineer disclosed information to me about how they were messing up a program, that I'd be court-martialed, and I refused to do it. So these people knew if I gave them my word, no one would ever know who they really were. And that's why there's a unique take on this. You're getting a story that's built from people who have lived this technology and under this cloak of secrecy. I lived it for 25 years. And then I realized we were the government. Next slide. <clears throat> One day while at Nellis, we were informed there was an F-15 that crashed out on the Nellis Range, which is near Area 51. This was in 1977. A lieutenant colonel uh, who was a commander and a pilot, and Doc Walters, the hospital commander at Nellis, actually flew into the side of a mountain while doing a routine functional check flight. Uh, I've written about this story in detail in Alien Rapture. A uh, sergeant who worked for me recovered the heads up, F-15 heads-up display film canister because he was assigned to the accident investigation team. He told me a guy in a dark jumpsuit from Washington, D.C., had immediately pounced on him and the camera when they recovered it out in the desert. Which was very unusual because everything else that was picked up was standard procedures, was logged, marked, photographed, and taken back to an assigned hangar for analysis. At the time, um, I'm not sure, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Fairchild, uh, was prototyping CCD cameras 
which is, uh, of course, everybody has them now, but uh, for the F-15. This uh, F-15 had a prototype video camera on it. It uh, also had a flight data recorder. This guy in the jumpsuit, when they were recovered, were turned over to him without question. So I don't know who he worked for, but I don't think he worked for the Air Force. <clears throat> a couple of weeks after the uh, crash, Gerald, and in fact, it's funny because the first time I ever met Gerald was at the Silver Dollar Saloon, uh, and, and he didn't drink. But uh, people with security clearances and a lot of pressure tend to drink or have other problems, and that's why he watched them. But uh, Gerald had told me that the uh, lieutenant colonel, who was uh, the pilot of the F-15 that had crashed, along with Doc Walters, radioed the Nellis Tower, and it said, and his words were, and I, I write everything down so I can quote other people instead of being glib. He, he said, this extremely large thing is over my aircraft, right on top of him, and he screamed to the tower. And he informed them that he was experiencing total loss of flight systems. His communications went immediately dead. Less than three seconds after the communications ended, they flew into the side of a mountain. <clears throat> Check it out. It's in the newspapers. Uh, back then, there was lawsuits, too. Gerald, uh, who was probably the most connected person, I've known a lot of connected people, um, before I got out of the defense industry, I could call up half of the CEOs or most of the VPs in any defense major defense contractor. But Gerald, I was in awe of him. He was so connected. <clears throat> Said that uh, the video from the uh, prototype CCD video camera showed that some type of oval vehicle of tremendous size was so close to the F-15 that it blocked out almost all light. He said that it was so close that the camera couldn't focus. And back then, they were just experimenting with CCD cameras that had automatic aperture and focus and everything. But this had it. It just it couldn't focus. So and, you know, we're talking about 10 feet. If you can imagine that, at doing 500 miles an hour. It's a little too close for comfort, obviously. <clears throat> anyway, unfortunately, uh, when the F-15 crashed into this mountainside, uh, they tried to eject right before impact. The UFL was still on top of them, and their bodies were torn to shreds. Officially, <laughs> as always is the case, pilot error. Pilot error. Of course, these guys were experts, but uh, it didn't matter. Pilot error caused a perfectly functioning aircraft in clear airspace with maximum visibility to crash. These are just some of the type of stories that I was given and have used in Alien Rapture. Next slide, please. Nevada calls itself the Silver, the Silver State, the Battleborn State, and the Sagebrush State. A more appropriate motto would be the Conspiracy State. I wonder if this room is bugged by the casino. <laughs> of 111,000 Square, land, <clears throat> square miles of land in Nevada, over 80% is controlled by the federal government, the highest percentage of any state in the union. If it were not for the gaming industry, the federal government would be the largest employer with 18,000 military and another 20,000 government contractors working at places like the Nevada test site, the Nellis Range, the Fallon Naval Air Station, and the Tonopah Range, and the aerospace industry. And by the way, you probably hear this eventually with somebody that comes forward, but the Nellis Range is not the most classified facility. I mean, excuse me, <clears throat> Area 51 or Groom Air Base is not the most classified facility in Nevada, and neither is Pap the stuff around Papoose. EGNG provides classified research, development, and services for the military and government. EGNG supplies the technical and scientific support in nu for nuclear testing and energy research and development programs. EGNG provided large diameter drilling and mining and excavation equipment for underground and mount mountainside facilities. They built these hidden bunkers, mountainside hangars, and vast underground facilities at Groom, Papoose, Mercury, and other places in Nevada. These facilities and observation posts are extremely well camouflaged. In fact, uh, I want to 
I keep wanting to tell you these little anecdotes, but I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time if I do. But we'll, we'll take some questions here. In 1972, EGNG was granted an indefinite contract called Project Red Light to support the DOE and military. It gave them responsibility to assist in recovery of nuclear materials in cases of mishaps and to provide aerial and ground security. Gerald said that uh, they were also responsible to the DOE and NSA and the MJ-12 committee, whether or not you believe in that, for reacting to sightings of UFOs and crashed vehicles and recovery of alien artifacts, as they're called. Okay, so now you say, what's going on today? The Hillary platform, the Avro Saucer, that's the Hillary platform, the Avro Saucer, and the Northrop Wings, where aerospace vehicles were advanced technology which emulated UFO characteristics were tested. See the, see the date that was flown? 1948? And everybody thinks the B-2 stealth bomber is just, you know, kind of, kind of funny. It looks a lot like it. <clears throat> Dr. Paul Hill, uh, a lot of you probably read his book. He's now deceased. There's going to be a lot of that going around. Uh, was a UFO investigator for NASA for over 30 years. Everything he wrote in his notes was classified top secret and he couldn't publish it. Uh, but his book got out because his daughter published this manuscript. If you want some more technical information, I suggest you read his book too. Lockheed's Advanced Development Projects Division, known as the Skunk Works, Skunk Works developed the A-12 for the CIA. What's really funny is 30 years after they built the SR-71, it broke the land speed record from L.A. to New York in one hour and four minutes. And it still didn't fly its max classified speed or altitude. Area 51, the Groom, Ace, <coughs> Groom Air Brace facilities, has a six-mile long runway, the longest in the U.S. The Department of Defense and the CIA used it for the Air Force's most exotic vehicles. Yes, why a six-mile long runway? Well, up until the SR-75, the vehicles that came after that, you need a runway with high takeoff speeds because they also have very high landing speeds. They have 75 degree or more radical swept back wings, or, uh, but they, the newer vehicles don't need long runways, so they've moved out of groom. My sources estimate that up to 35 percent of SDI funding was siphoned off to provide primary expenditures for the Air Force's most secret black program ever. It was started in 1982. For those who haven't already figured it out, the Aurora program is not a vehicle. The Aurora program is a code name for the ongoing project to research and develop advanced aerospace vehicles. And there have been a number of them, and we'll get to that. For the last few years, high-tech buffs have speculated at least one new an exotic aerospace vehicle existed, the SR-75, the first operational Aurora program vehicle, went operational after two years of flight testing in 1989. The top secret SR-75 is, is a hypersonic strategic reconnaissance spy plane called the Penetrator. It is a mother ship, which I'll, I'm getting into here. Hypersonic speeds, by the way, start at Mach 5. The SR-75 replaced the SR-71. Now, this thing's been flying operational for nine years. This is old technology. The new SR-75, I call it new because it's new to a lot of people, is capable of positioning anywhere in the world in less than three hours. It carries multispectral sensors, such as optical, radar, infrared, and laser. The SR-75 far exceeded the classified military speed and altitude records of the old SR-71. The SR-75 has attained altitudes of over 120,000 feet and speeds exceeding Mach 5 or five times the speed of sound. That's over 3,300 miles per hour. From takeoff to landing, the 75 can make a round trip from central Nevada at the time to northeast Russia and back in under three hours. I suggest if you're hurry, don't take the Concorde. <laughs> I, I, I'll, you can just, can everybody read that, that in the back? It's 162 feet long and 98 feet wide. The belly stands 10 feet off the ground. 
I know, Gerald was six feet, but two methane and LOX fuel high bypass turbo ramjet engines are housed under each wing. Now, I'm going to skip to the next slide because I'm running behind. See, you have to buy the book to read what I skipped. <laughs> the SR-75 and the uh, daughtership SR-74 were built by Lockheed Advanced <laughs> Development <coughs> Company, which everybody knows is Skunk Works. And uh, the SR-74 daughtership is called the Scramp. It's kind of cute, huh? But it stands for Scramjet and Rocket Propulsion. The Scramjet is a supersonic combustion ramjet. Uh, Gerald and one other source uh, witnessed the first flight of the SR-75 with the SR-74 piggyback out of Area 51 before my friend Glenn Campbell moved in up there and scared them all off. It was the sitting piggyback the SR-75, and he said, uh, I guess it was back as early as 1975 that uh, he knew that they were developing uh, the SR-75, which is pretty incredible. I guess it took them uh, 12 or 13 years to get this thing fine right, so it must be some pretty good technology. The uh, SR-74 can't take off from the ground. It has to be on top of the SR-75, above 100,000 feet altitude. Then it can attain orbital altitudes. The SCRAMP launches ferret satellites for the National Security Agency that weigh 2,000 pounds <coughs> or less and measure 6 feet by 5 feet. But as you can imagine, the, the old satellites that were big as a van, you can pretty much now make one about the size of a briefcase, so you don't need booster rockets. Na the NASA space shuttle, I'm here to tell you, is really an antique by comparison. The joke is on us. If you think these rumors are far-fetched, look at the YB-49 and the XB-70 flown in 1948 and 1964, respectively. Now look at the SR-75, which has been spotted numerous times. You say the government can't keep a secret? Boy, you're wrong. There's new rumors from my sources that two new, orbited, <coughs> two new vehicles have been placed in permanent orbit. One of these vehicles is the Space Orbital Nuclear Service Intercept Vehicle. Sun Civ. When you hear it from another reliable source in 10 years, you'll remember this. It's codenamed Locust. The SR-74 and the TR-3B flying triangle can deliver spares, replacement units, service fuels, chemicals, and modules to the Sun Civ, or Locust. The robotic Sun Civ uses deliverables to service, calibrate, repair, and replace parts on the newer NSA, CIA, and NRO ferret satellites. And I know for a fact that they were developing a robotic repair of electronics equipment as far back as 81, because I worked a program to where they didn't want technicians looking at the equipment. Remember, I was in the forefront of automatic test equipment when they didn't even have a computer to, run, to automate anything with. Finally, I've saved the best for last, the operational model of the TR-3B. Uh, a friend of mine said he would never forget the sight of the alien-looking TR-3B landing at Papoose, south of Groom. The pitch black triangular-shaped TR-3B is rarely mentioned and then only in whispers. Next slide. <clears throat> the original TR-3B is was 200 feet across the prototype. It was codenamed Astra, and I was just informed by Jeff Rents when I did his radio show that Astra has, has connections all the way back uh, to the Indian flying vehicles several thousand years ago, which is interesting they codenamed it Astra. The tactical reconnaissance TR-3B first flight was in the early 90s. The triangular-shaped nuclear-powered aerospace platform was developed under the top-secret Aurora program. 
by 1994, there were three billion-dollar-plus operational models. These are this, the operational model is 600 feet across. This fine triangle is not fiction. If you don't believe me, ask the tens of thousands of people who have now spotted one version or another of it from Belgium to England. Ken can tell you about people that have seen it in England to Arizona. The TR-3B vehicle's outer coating is reactive to electrical radar stimulation and can change reflectiveness, radar absorptiveness, and color. The polymer skin, when used in conjunction with electronics countermeasures and ECCM, can make the vehicle look like a small aircraft, flying cylinder, or even trick radar receivers into falsely detecting a variety of aircraft, an aircraft in another location, multiple aircraft, are no aircraft at all. The circular plasma field accelerator ring called the magnetic field disruptor surrounds a rotatable crew compartment. It's far ahead of anything you've ever imagined as far as technology. Sandia and Livermore Laboratories developed a reverse engineered MFD and I believe the government will go at any lengths to protect this technology. But you're not going to be able to build one of these from what I tell you. Nor am I. So, The government will go to any lengths Believe me, the plasma in this accelerator is mercury-based. It's pressurized at 250,000 atmospheres at a temperature of 150 degrees Kelvin, superconductivity, and accelerated to 60,000 revolutions per minute to create a superconductive plasma with the resulting gravity energy. The MFD generates a magnetic vortex field, which disrupts and neutralizes the effects of gravity on mass within proximity by 89%. Do not misunderstand. This is not anti-gravity. Anti-gravity you can use as a propulsive force. The mass of the circular accelerator and all the mass within the accelerator, such as the crew compartment, avionics, MFD systems, fuels, environmental systems, and nuclear reactor are reduced by 89%. This causes the effect of making the aircraft extremely light and able to outperform any aircraft yet constructed, uh, except of course those we didn't build. Uh, TR-3B is a high altitude stealth reconnaissance platform with indefinite loiter time. Once you get it up there at speed, it doesn't take much propulsion, propulsion to maintain altitude. With the vehicle's mass reduced by 89%, the vehicle can travel at Mach 9 vertically or horizontally. So for those that have had sightings of things making right, and they're not perfect right turns, obviously. Nothing can make a perfect right turn. It's against the laws of physics. But it sure looks like a right turn at a distance. For those that have seen it, that's how they do it. The TR-3B is, uh, uses three multi-mode thrusters mounted on each corner of the triangular platform. I was going to go into liquid and hydrogen, oxygen, rocket engines, and all that. Next slide, but uh, I'm not going to have any time here. The multi-mode propulsion system can operate in the atmosphere with thrust provided by the nuclear reactor, and in the upper atmosphere with hydrogen propulsion, and in orbit with combined hydrogen and oxygen propulsion. The original picture of the TR-3B was taken with a digital camera that was carried on a <clears throat> Special Operation C-130 out of Herbert Field. It was flying mission support for the TR-3B. Uh, the current picture, by the way, that was developed uh, with 3D Studio from that digital picture hangs in the black vault at uh, Lockheed. That's all I can tell you about that. <laughs> Minimum of four. Uh, next slide. That uh, is a C-130, by the way, that he was flying. Many sightings of UFOs are not alien vehicles, but top-secret TR-3B, uh, other Aurora vehicles. Next slide. That was the original digital picture. Next slide. I do have 25 minutes? Okay, I'm stick skipping a lot of stuff. Um, Really? 
Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of confusion, like the Aurora program being an aircraft. There's also a lot of confusion. I had this discussion with a pilot that was telling me that a TR-3B had to look like a TR-3A. That used to be the case, by the way. The TR-3B was modified, the TR-3 was a concept vehicle, was modified to the TR-3A, which looks like a flat jelly bean, bat wing shaped vehicle. Uh, I believe Bill Sweetman in her, the Aurora book pictured it. But the TR-3B has nothing in common with the TR-3A. That doesn't look anything like what Bill uh, Sweetman pictured. And then there's a tier two, three, and four. There's also a TR-3C. And then there's tier three minuses and tier three pluses. And every one of these are distinctly different vehicles. And the government has done this. It's their shell game with nomenclature. So if you see a TR-3A and you see a TR-3B and you start comparing, you didn't see the same thing. And if you have heard from somebody a nomenclature and you're comparing, yeah, yeah, that sounds like the TR-3, you mean your TR, then it doesn't match up. Stinky, aren't they? Before Ger Gerald died, we had a long conversation. He was sure he had documentation that could prove the existence of reverse engineering of alien technology. Uh, we talked about a lot of things, but I don't know. I've published just almost everything that was given to me or passed on to me. Uh, I don't know what else he knew. He was obsessed with quasi-crystals, and I'm not even going to get into that because I'm not a physicist, and I don't want to understand that. I also believe that Colonel Corso, you like that picture? Uh, whoever can really f figure out what it really is, then I'll buy you a Coke. You ever seen a convertible aircraft? Leave it, leave it there for a second. Can everybody see that? I'm, I'm going to just leave it here just for a second. I'm deviating from our program here. I received the MJ-12 documents from Dale, who I mentioned earlier, as one of my five closest friends for over 20 years. In fact, Dale and I knew each other from our first trip to Vietnam in 69. His father now, has been, before he retired, put in 30 years, almost 30 years with the NSA, and transferred over as a military officer. When uh, I sent Dale a copy of the manuscript before I even got to, shortly before Brad Steiger got involved with the project, uh, he read as did all my friends that were still around that gave me input, read a draft to make sure that I hadn't misquoted them or I hadn't given out any information they were uncomfortable with or they felt they could be identified with. So Dale was reading the manuscript and his dad and him were very close. Uh, said, I'm going to give you some documents. And he says, they're blackened out. And he says, but I want you to retype them and where there's black, blacked out, just leave spaces. Dell's father is the one that passed on the MJ-12 documents to me. Okay, next slide. And we're going to get into this here. Uh, that's just a cool picture. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> that's supposed to be a wormhole in the TR-3B. And I tried to visualize what they were doing with these quasi-crystals, and that's, that's my visualization. Okay, next. For the remaining time I have, I'm going to discuss the uh, MJ-12 documents I received. There, uh, there's already been a lot of controversy over this, and I'm just barely going to be able to scratch probably what 2% of what's in the book. And I'm going to let y'all, any of the interested, read this while I take questions and answers. But I'll tell you this, when, a couple things when we get through them. This was, these documents I received, and by the way, I've, rec I've copyrighted every do government document I've got my hands on or information, because I want the government to come for us and say, we have a copyright to that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, think, I hope they do. Okay, now, um, can, uh, can y'all read that? No. Well, it's going to shorten my question and answer, but I'm going to read a couple things to you. The presidential order signed in 1987. Uh, previous slide, back up just one real quick. The most fascinating things to me was, one, it's an unnumbered order, which, by the way, is not uncommon. It's, this is not the only unnumbered presidential order there's ever been. You can find that out for your research. And secondly, it's authorized by proxy. That's scary. It's like, 
It's like giving your ex your checkbook with all and a signature and a signature stamp. You know, it's like. Okay, next slide. By virtue of the authority vested in me as the chairman of the Mars Jupiter 12 committee and ultra, <clears throat> ultra secret committee established by President Truman with full consent and permanent voting members of the Mars Jupiter 12 committee, this presidential order by proxy is established as follows. Now, I, I'm not going to get in debate with anybody about what Majestic 12 stands for. This Mars Jupiter was on the document. And I know that a lot of people think it stands for a lot of other things. And uh, I've been hearing, I, I'm not a UFO person. <laughs> I was a technology person. I haven't read a lot of these books, but I heard there's a, um, is it Sitchin that discuss the uh, 12th planet? So I'm, I believe these documents are real. Whether or not you believe them, is, you know, it's your right. But uh, Mars Jupiter 12 has never been used in with Majestic 12 or MJ 12. So I wanted to clarify that this is definitely different. I know it, you know it. And for those that think I might have mistyped something wrong, that's the way I got it. Charter. This is pretty scary stuff. There is hereby established a strategic group of key government personnel called the Mars Jupiter 12 Committee, referred to as MJ 12, with the authority to take any action to the maximum extent possible in relation to foreign or alien data, materials, information, technology, artifacts, and extraterrestrial biological entities, all hereafter referred to as foreign artifacts, which may bear upon the national security of the United States of America. Amendments to this charter and foreign artifacts, materials, and information shall be classified to the highest levels available to the U.S. government. The MJ-12 committee's actions and directives will be referred to as a program outside the MJ-12 membership. The MJ-12 committee shall have sole United States governmental authority to direct each FA aspect, foreign artifact, or substance, and to make sure that each foreign artifact <coughs> make such foreign artifact available to the president or the members of the MJ-12 committee. Next slide. The several departments and agencies of the government and Department of Defense as identified by the MJ-12 committee shall be notified by, the, by department directive to consider any foreign artifact is highly classified and alert DOD Foreign Technology Division immediately upon occasion of any incidents, happenstance, or encounter with foreign artifact. We now know what a foreign artifact is. We've seen a few of them. Uh, next slide. Next slide. The, uh, before somebody really good at researching, discover, stop there, discovers the uh, date on the, uh, go back one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Before somebody just, <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to deviate from this just a second. I'm going to clarify something. Certain dates and names were left out of these documents. I personally fill them in. Brad and I talked about who was most likely the person we did our best guess. But before somebody really good at research discovers that February 22nd is my birth date, I'm going to tell you it is. The year was the in there, but not the date. So I put the February 22nd in. It's cool. It's George Washington's birthday. Now, the original MJ-12 documents presented by Brad Steiger, uh, Stanton Friedman, and uh, Shandera, I think I'll get the name wrong, but referred to an attachment D, or autopsy report. Next page, uh, next slide. These are just dates and names that are very similar to the original MJ-12 document. Next. The purpose of this preliminary postmortem examination is to determine the cause and manner of death, the origin of the entities, and the type of biological life form. Uh, we don't get to the meat if we don't move through this general stuff. Next one. This basically talks about unidentified debris, 
where it was crashed, who was there. Next slide. <clears throat> now, what you have to remember is I received and copyrighted this information prior to 1994. This is before Corso ever wrote his first draft. It was before the alien autopsy film was known about even by Tim Chawcroft, who I just did a video interview with last night, and they were the first to publish the alien autopsy. All this was copyrighted before anybody knew anything about things that have come since. And this is another thing that validates these documents, at least for me. One is the fact that they discussed that all the bodies were identical. And trust me, when a military says identical, we're talking identical. I'm not going to read the details because there's some highlights I want to get into. Next slide. You're talking about the, the covers. Don't go back, but on the previous page, at the end, it said uh, a dark, coarsely textured, flat, black, seamless, almond shaped apparatus covers each eye with no apparent attachment points. For a lack of better description, eyeglasses or sunglasses come to mind. Perhaps their apparatus is an aid in distance viewing, blocking harmful solar, solar radiation, enhanced spectrum detection, low light or infrared vision, or some other unknown use. Again, I will make a point of this. Before Corso wrote about seeing these funny lenses, before the alien autopsy, the y'all that seen it, remember them peeling off these little black lenses for everybody that says aliens have black eyes. Well, we, these guys have been hanging around Hollywood because they're wearing shades. Okay? These, they are not their natural eyes. They have some type of lens. All this was copyrighted prior to 1994. We have documentation. We can prove it to anybody just like I did the Brits. When they asked me if I could prove I did all the jobs, I said I brought 200 documents. And it's all going to be on their film, by the way. So that, to me, it's just, it's just extremely fascinating to know that you know, I got all a document. I didn't even know what MJ-12 was, by the way, when I got these documents. Color me stupid. I just didn't know. Uh, the other point, <clears throat> other than eyes, uh, this, this has never been discussed. I, it's, it's a shame we can't talk to the government people that uh, did the alien autopsy so they could spread a little di disinformation. It says, tiny lines run horizontally from head to foot, much like record grooves, but smaller, and are only discernible through a magnifying glass or microscope. Uh, to me, the only reason you'd have something like that is if this thing was a manufactured being, which would also explain why they're identical, and for energy absorption of wide spectrum. And the other thing that, uh, since this, we can prove this was copyrighted long before this other stuff, it says at the bottom, one large geo-organ is present. How many of y'all remember on the cadaver of the alien on the alien autopsy and they opened it up and there was one kind of round organ in the middle that just looked like, you know, one of those stupid donut tires they put in your trunk that never work. <laughs> so, I mean, here again you have my, my belief from my sources and documents that we copyrighted that the alien autopsy was done under the direction of the government. And it was done as close as possible to the real thing. Because the best lie is always the lie that's closest to the truth. What would convince you more, I mean, if they'd had a triangular shaped being with 12 legs, and it's supposedly the real autopsy, or one that was identical to the real autopsy, except it had an extra finger. To me, the one with the extra finger would confuse people far more than a better looking film of something really bizarre. By the way, psychological operations is an industry in the military. And there are thousands of people that work in it, and they're good at it. So I'm going to take questions, and you can put up the next slide for them to look at, because they won't look at me anymore. Um, how much time do I have, or am I out? OK. I promised you. If you want to ask a question. Questions, yeah. please. Um, 
grab that. Okay, two questions I have. Number one, you are going to discuss reverse engineering on alien materials. Are you going to get into that? Okay, I have eight minutes, but here, here, I'll tell you what I know. Uh, Gerald said that uh, the guy that worked for him as a national security investigator was at Groom when they tested the accelerator of the TR-3B the first time. And uh, it just it's probably one of the more fascinating stories I've ever heard in my life. They said they strapped down this 200-foot accelerator. He, he was explaining it. He says, imagine a really fat hula hoop with big weights around it where the superconductive magnets... They bolted this thing down with bolts that were two feet across into concrete. The chain links were six feet. I mean, if you can imagine a chain link out of steel. They bolted this thing down. He said <laughs> he couldn't believe it. It was just like the Manhattan Project. They didn't know if this thing was going to burn a hole through the earth, set off a chain reaction in the atmosphere, or take out everybody in northern and central Nevada. <laughs> they turned this thing on, and they've got... I mean, dozens of cameras, people kidding around places where they could watch the cameras, and they held their breath, and nothing happened. Nothing. $20 billion to develop the accelerator from 1965. And, and I know a guy that worked at General Dynamics, when they, and, and they might have been doing it before that, but I can track it back as, as far as 1965. You know, that much time, that much money, it did nothing. However, they figured out, after a while, I guess somebody must have walked up to it like, you know, an old, uh, a car that won't start and kicks the tire. They figured out the thing was 89% of the mass and weight was reduced. So what do you do when you have a flying saucer that you tried to build? It's kind of like the Indians if we drove up a, you know, a Model T back in the American Indians and say, hey, you can build all these you want. And they go, thanks a lot. <laughs> but we built this accelerator trying to emulate saucer-like technology and we only achieve part of its effect. So what do you do when you have a circle that's real light and you can put a lot of stuff in it without adding weight to it? How do you propel it? There's only one way. You hang a triangle on it and you put three engines, conventional multi-mode rocket engines, of course they're very advanced, and you fly this circle around with the crew and reconnaissance and cameras and everything else in it. Uh, that's, just, that's just one of the things that I hope to explain to you good people is there is a flying triangle, but it's ours. Mm -hmm. The flying triangles are not theirs. Aliens don't transverse the universe or come from another dimension and take the time to redesign their technology that they've had for eons. We have redesigned their technology and we can't get it to work right. So we put a triangle on it. It's just very simple. On the Aurora, which you have now explained as a project, not a thing, one of the vehicles is reputed to be a diamond-shaped object that comes in over the West Coast in excess of 4,000 miles an hour. Do you know anything about that particular vehicle? I've heard rumors, but I don't have anybody I trust that's told me uh, anything about it that I could discuss it. But you have, to, uh, you have to understand that as far back as late Vietnam War, we could make a radar signature on any radar in the world, see anything they wanted with electronic countermeasures and ECCM, which is counter countermeasures. We now have stealth coatings that can put any type of camouflage for visual observation generators, by the way, and I don't have time to get into this, but at Papoose, where they store one of the TR-3Bs, and they maintain these as their depot, it's built into the side of a mountain, cut out of stone. They have a holographic generator that generates the side of the mountain, and when you're 10 feet from the side of this mountain and looking into the hangar, you can only see a mountain. And that's why when the Russian satellites fly over to verify the SALT treaty, when their infrared and other spectral scanners shoot down at Groom, they only see stone, because that's all that's there. I'm sorry. Okay, now. a couple of questions that should have short answers. First one is, uh, what do you think of Bob Lazar's uh, story and uh, what the other previous gentleman just said, you're, you're basically saying all we have from the uh, reverse engineering is a flying triangle, so you're basically saying we do not have saucers. If we do, then they're extraterrestrial, you know, which ties in with the Bob Lazar story. The other part is last year, Popular Science did an article 
that uh, some of the black projects from uh, Area 51 have been relocated to north central Utah. Uh, the reason being given is that the 1950s uh, nuclear tests in the Area 51 uh, um, have, have, been, have been kind of... You on the first question. Oh. Let's stop there for a second. Oh, okay. First of all, everybody asked me about Bob Lazar, and I don't have anything negative to say about anybody I've never met, and I wouldn't say anything in public. But my only explanation is... Uh, my only explanation is he might have seen the accelerator, which is a saucer. Okay. Okay, the second thing is I showed the Brits last night, and I'm not going to make a habit of doing this, so they've got it on film, almost 200 documents showing that I had crypto, special access, special programs to verify my credibility. Nobody has ever mentioned the goggles. If I forget everything I've ever known about black programs, I'll never forget feeling nauseous from wearing those damn things. So how do you forget something that causes you discomfort every time you leave a building? Okay. Uh, as far as Utah, absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing top secret at Groom anymore. All the, the only thing that's left there is the stuff they've moved south that can, does, only needs short runway or no runway. So that, that story is basically bogus, that they did not move anything to north central Utah. I don't know where they moved them to. I've oh, disassociated okay. myself from all the government three years ago to protect everybody I ever knew. My information is three years old. Don't know anything new. Don't want to know anything new. Okay. If Nellis isn't the most secret facility in Nevada, which is? <laughs> If you've uh, been listening, and I know I refer to my notes a lot, but this was done in a hurry. I had a lot of the pressing things. The Defense Advanced Research Center, it's the coolest acronym in the world, mm -hmm. DARK. Mm -hmm. There's 10 stories underground, and I'm talking about massive amount of square feet south of Papoose. It was all built by EG&G. Okay. That's the most classified place in Nevada, and I keep getting all these. Okay. One more. If the triangle is so super, super secret, why did they fly it over Europe for everyone to see? Okay, imagine as we will, and I'm stopping, and she's giving that look. Uh, <laughs> the War of the Worlds broadcast, the Brookings and Rands studies that we couldn't handle it. They're testing the waters, I suspect. I don't know. I don't have any information on that. I thank you so much for your kindness and having me. I'll be outside with cards that have web page information, email, ordering information, and even a couple of copies of my CD on behavioral modification. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very, very much. I'm so glad you met back. Thank you. Could you back back box of my slides and give me a camp on it? Yeah, we're right on it right now. Okay. Here. Do any of the kind <laughs> Eisenhower got sold out. I think that he realized that all of a sudden this 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 matter is is going into uh and the control of corporations, he uh, realized that he was losing control. He realized that this, this, the phenomenon of of uh, of whatever it was that uh, that we were faced with uh, was not going to be in the best hands. And that that those were the, as far as I can remember, that was the expression that was used. It's not going to be in the best hands. And so it has turned out to be. One day, uh, Sergeant uh, Allen and uh, and uh, uh, the other the other sergeant and I, I'll remember his name soon. Sergeant Atkins. They were and Sergeant uh, Montalegra and, and uh, they they came to us and said, "Look, you know, we got we got a situation where we we have one, an aircraft crash that's possibly friendly, and they need us to go and, and secure the crash site." And uh, well, we found the area really easy because there was a there was a huge gash in the land where where something had crashed. Everything was burned, and it was like 
like if you had almost cut like a, a warm butter with a knife I mean it was just it's like it's it's like something on fire or had enter or some kind of energy like a laser almost had had like gutted I mean it was really strange and and basically we were the first ones to see the object and basically what happened is we didn't go straight up the hill because basically this thing went up the hill and then off into the side of, 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 of the ravine of the ridge. This is about a 200 foot ridge at least. It was buried in, a, in, in the side of the cliff. But anyway, we didn't go straight up. We went to the, to the, to on to the left and walked up to the top of the ridge. And that's when we saw the craft. Basically, uh, this is a huge ship and 10 meters in width and about 20 meters in length. I'm just not sure, that's just an estimate from what I remember. But it was huge. I mean, it was big, man. And it was shaped like almost like between an egg and like a teardrop almost. And when I first saw it, you know, I was scared. It scared the, you know, the heck out of me, you know. I didn't know what to do. And it was dripping this syrup like, uh, like syrup viscosity, this liquid. Uh, it was everywhere, all down, everywhere when we went down there because there was plants and everything. And it was, it was weird. It was a, a, a purplish green color. And it kind of like like fluctuated, like you couldn't really when you you'd look at it one time, then you look at it again, and it would like it's almost like it. I don't know if it was like alive and it was just changing, but every time you looked at it, you saw a different shade of, of greenish purple. It was strange. There was a, there was one light on it that slowly went around, and, it, and and the machine I could hear it, I could hear I guess because it was still functioning, and it had like a like a, a hum to it, like like a really bass. Like say if you unplugged an amp from a guitar, that kind of, mm, you know, it was really, really, you know, it was really deep, and it kind of fluctuated, and then finally it just cut off, and everything just seemed to stop. Uh, when I was looking at the craft, it was buried, so I could see the back of it, and there were these large vents. Well, that, uh, they look like vents, sort of like a fish gill on the back. I couldn't see around the other side, and I guess I'm assuming that it was the same way on the other side. That looked like I don't know that they, they could that could have been used for propulsion. I'm not sure. You know, in Stinger School, they teach you about all different kinds of aircraft and stuff like that. And I knew I knew a lot of aircraft anyway because I I like I like reading about aircraft and data and that stuff. And uh, well, essentially, when I saw it, I'm like, man, this is not this is nothing that I knew of. When I saw the the aircraft, it had been hit by something something that had that had took it out this is what I think happened is we shot it down the Peruvian shot it down the other guys knew it was flying I knew that these these aircraft were flying because I had been in the command center there at the radar installation and 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 I heard a couple women there in the Air Force talking about aircraft uh, flying in and out of the atmosphere in Mach 10 plus all oh, this this happened all the time. There was like three or four incidents where I was duty there. That the same uh, the same Air Force officer came in there to get books. The reason I, I guess the reason they were taking them is they didn't want people to know that they're tracking these aircraft. I guess I mean again this I'm just assuming that.